Well, good morning, my friends. Uh, I bring you encouragement and positivity of spirit. Uh, I wish that for you. I uh, pray that you're able to find that as you make your way through each day. I'm grateful that we're here together again uh, just to share in these moments online. Um, had a great service last week at our outdoor barn service. Um, I'm excited to get together with some folks, and I know that some of you weren't able to make that. I do want to let you know that we've kind of made the decision that December the 6th, that's the first Sunday in December. Uh, we are going to have services back in our building once again. Now, we're going to do some things to try and keep everybody safe as possible. Uh, we will actually encourage um, wearing of masks. We'll have pews marked off so that we have some social distancing going on. Certainly, if you're in a family and your family group can sit together again, I just want to try and create that space. And uh, for at least that month of December, we're going to go to two services at 9.30 and 10.30, just giving us a greater opportunity for people to spread out. Um, I love the intimacy of our facility, uh, but you know as well as I do that uh, if our normal Sunday crowd shows up, it's going to be pretty much impossible to keep six feet from each other. Uh, so we're going to offer a 9.30 and a 10.30, and we're going to ask that you sign up for one of those two, just so we can make sure that we're kind of spread out for both of those. And we'll have that available online here in the next week or so uh, as we aim for that first Sunday in December to get back together again. And I know I'm looking forward to seeing your faces and uh, connecting with you once more. So just stay tuned, and we'll be sharing more information about that in the days to come. Um, you know, we just wrapped up a series called Be Encouraged. I uh, thought it was appropriate for us to, to look for spiritual and scriptural encouragement. Um, and now we're going to go through just the month of November in a new series called Becoming More. And it's that idea of being able to grow as we find our way forward in spiritual maturity. And we're going to look at this series through four weeks in the book of Philippians. And just looking at each of the four chapters, just a, a small portion of scripture in each one that I hope will kind of push us towards seeing where we can grow, where we can increase in faith and become more. Uh, as we do that, again, I, I encourage you to, to practice those spiritual habits that are important to you, uh, to take time to find some music online, to listen to music as it encourages you. You know, we do some music here every now and then. Also, I want to just tell you that you keep taking communion, finding ways to practice taking communion, even on your own or with your family, wherever you might be. And then if you choose to give, if generosity is a part of, of your spiritual practices, then you can certainly do so by mailing a check to the church, or you can go on our website, use our online giving, whatever you're most comfortable with. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to these next four weeks of becoming more, and we're going to start in Philippians chapter 1 today. This may not be something that we do quite as often anymore, uh, but whenever you used to watch late night TV, there would always be infomercials. And they were trying to, to pitch their product. They wanted you to buy this, and you only paid for shipping and handling, or uh, this would happen. This is a great deal. They, maybe they'd offer you two for the price of one. But one of the phrases that always kind of stuck in my mind from watching those infomercials for so many years was, but wait, there's more. They always had something they were trying to sucker you in with, right? Something they wanted to, to add a little extra benefit. They wanted you to think about that idea of, wait, there's more. And what they were really talking about was that there was another level to what they were going to provide for you, right? And they were trying to get you to lean into this so that you would be interested in what they were offering. Well, I think that we too can focus on the principle of, but wait, there's more. And it becomes personal when we start thinking about how we can become more, that, that we're not done growing yet, that whatever we might think and wherever we might be on our spiritual journey, there is always the idea available for us of becoming more than we are. We've got to ask ourselves the question, though, as we enter into that, do we believe that we can become more than we currently are? We've got to have that, that confidence, that, that, that belief, that desire within us that we can progress beyond this point, that we can move past where we are on our own spiritual journeys, all of us at slightly different places along that continuum. But do we believe that we can keep moving? And, and sometimes I think we've got to really just take a good look at where we are to see where we can go. We've got to have some idea of what that looks like and then allow the divine, the holy, God's influence in us to shape us as we start moving that way. 
And as we, as we jump into this series in Philippians, looking at these four chapters, we're, we're going to start in Philippians chapter 1 today, and we're going to look at verses 3 to 11. And, and we're going to see how Paul is writing to the church. He's talking to people who are following the pathway of Christ. And, and I kind of think the overarching piece of what we're going to look at in this particular text is just simply this. Experiencing grace expands our thinking and it guides our actions experiencing grace expands our thinking and guides our actions. Isn't that a mark of growth though, right? And when we encounter the holy, we encounter what God has for us and and the influence of his Holy Spirit and the, the influence we certainly see in the pathway of Christ, then that does affect the way that we think and then it will guide our actions. So in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says this, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. And God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, Paul is clearly expressing gratitude. He has this this relationship he's developed that they started this church, began this church together, they made their way forward, and then he's moved on. And the church here in Philippi, this group of Philippians, have continued to support Paul. They've continued to encourage Paul. They've they've continued to send Paul money. They've continued to send Paul letters. So they've established this relationship that keeps going. And Paul is grateful for that. And he talks about the depth of care that they have for each other. He talks about the consistency of prayer, that he continues to pray for them and knows they're praying for him. That there's a commitment that they share, a commitment to this pathway of following Christ. And that in this, they share grace. And then the the tail end of what we just read in verses 8 to 11, Paul is talking about what happens when we pray for those things, right? He says, so that. Those are two key words. He says, all of this that I'm praying for, I want this to happen for you so that. So see, what what Paul is trying to communicate is, this is not just doing it for the sake of doing it so you can check off the box. This is leading us somewhere further along in our journey. That there's a depth of spiritual connection that's taking place, not just within that group of people or with Paul, but also in their commitment to God. So yes, I think we can probably all agree that change needs to take place. Maybe the question we need to answer as we walk through this is what changes us? What is it that causes us to be transformed? What is it that causes us to grow? Well, I think perhaps what we've got to do, at least to start this way, is to recognize that God has a plan for our growth. God has a plan for our growth. Go back into verse 6. Paul says, being confident of this, that he, he's talking about God, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He's saying God started something in you and he's going to carry it on to completion, which means it's not done yet. And God's not just throwing stuff against the wall to see perhaps it might stick, right? He's not just guessing and saying, well, I don't know, that didn't work out. Let's try this and see what happens, right? He he doesn't operate the same way that we do. Instead, God is saying, I've got a secure plan that I have started change and growth in you and I'm taking you somewhere. There's an intentionality behind this. In the message Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of scripture in Philippians 1 verses 5 and 6, just a kind of a different take on it. Paul says, I am so pleased that you have continued on in this with us, believing and proclaiming God's message from the day you heard it right up to the present. 
There has never been the slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish on the very day Christ Jesus appears. I love that idea that God has started something. There's this consistency of faith, consistency of the work that God is doing and a promise that it will end well. That God's plan will not fail. It does not falter. And the God who started something in us will continue it in us throughout our lifetime. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't have periods of struggle. You know as well as I do that there's not always where every day you're just flat out running at full speed spiritually, making all these gains and growth. That There are some days like that, but there are some days that we struggle through that. You know, and, and again, I go back to, to a physical fitness metaphor, if you will, that sometimes we reach plateaus. And, and if you've ever worked out or you've run, you know, there's some days you make gains and you're able to lift more weight, or maybe you're, you're trying to lose weight and you feel like those pounds are tick, tick, ticking away. And then you reach this plateau where it seems like, man, I'm putting in all the work and nothing seems to be changing. I, I'm putting in all the extra efforts and nothing seems to be happening. Am I making any progress? Is this worth it? Sometimes we've got to remind ourselves when we feel like we've plateaued, when we feel like we've kind of hit that proverbial wall, if you will, we've got to remind ourselves that God is still working this. He still has a plan. And if you're like me, there are too many times I've started my own projects and I've just been incomplete in completing those, right? That lack of follow through. How many household projects have you started and then it takes you forever and ever and ever to finish them. We can't ever get them done. We don't cross them off our list like we want to cross them off our list. Even though we may not feel we have reached that quote-unquote finish line, we may not be where we want to be, God's not done. He is still continuing and he will follow through. And when you have committed yourself to following on that pathway of Christ, then you now have the Holy Spirit that lives within you and it enables you on a regular basis to become more Christ-like. That every day we can make some amount of progress to become more Christ-like. So how can we take action on that? Recognizing that God has a plan for us, what can we do as in that partnership of the gospel that Paul talked about? What can we do to make sure we're following that plan? Well, one, I think we've got to make a plan, right? You, you've got to have some idea of what you're going to do to grow, to, to set up those practices that you know help you along the way. So whether that is meditation and prayer, uh, holy readings, journaling, uh, serving others, finding ways to encourage other people, uh, just that, that idea of quiet and solitude and allowing yourself to rest in moments, what are the things that you will set up ahead of time so that you have success moving forward with your plan to grow? But if you have a plan... Then, then the next action step for you is to measure that plan, to evaluate it. All right, I can write a plan down on paper, but if I don't ever follow the plan, then all my planning was for nothing. So let's carefully evaluate. Let's carefully assess whether we're following the things that we said mattered to us most. But I would also encourage you through that to make sure that we're taking time to listen to the voice of our divine creator. If God has started this in us and he's seeing it forward to completion, then let these spiritual practices be ways that we listen to where God is guiding us, that he's going to change our viewpoint on some things. He's going he's to let us see things in a different light. He's going to open up our eyes to be aware of people and needs around us that we can fit and fill. He's going to make us see some things within us that need to be chiseled and shaped and smoothed and, and perhaps rebuilt. But if we're not listening, then we won't be able to know where he's taking us. And I think we just simply have to then commit to, all right, I'm going to follow this pathway. I'm going to believe that God is doing this. And I'm going to believe that today is going to be better than yesterday. And that tomorrow is going to be better than today. 
I think sometimes because we have maybe faltered on a plan or we haven't seen the growth that we want, we, we tend to beat ourselves up spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Oh, I didn't do this and it's been this long and I haven't done this. If we just go to the simple mantra of today will be better than yesterday, tomorrow will be better than today, then we can take it forward a step at a time. And God will help you grow in grace until his work is completed. And that's what he's doing. But I also encourage you, as Paul led us deeper into this prayer, to let love shape the way you think. Because yes, we're, we're going to believe that God has a plan for our growth. We're, we're committing ourselves to figuring out and following what that plan is. But now let's let love shape the way that we think about things as we grow. If you go back to verses 9 and 10, Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. That tells me that our love can grow, right? It can increase exponentially. Our love can abound more and more as Paul talked about it. And, and that it can become more than it currently is. But then there's also that willingness to let love shape the way that we think, to learn new things, to move beyond just facts, to instead moving to wisdom, to increasing our understanding of what it is that we face, to seeing that, that ability to, to look at things and not just take them at face value and not just accept somebody else's interpretation of it, but be willing to listen to the Holy Spirit guide us forward. In, in verses 9 and 10, in this same passage from the message, just again, a different perspective. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. <clears throat> Pardon. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus will be proud of. That idea of flourishing, that our love would flourish and also do well. To me, there's an idea of thriving, an idea of, of multiplying. And then Paul, I love the message translation of that. It really gets to me to think about that phrase of loving, how not only do we increase the quantity of our love, we increase the quality of our love. Right? Not only that we love a lot, but that we love well. And then as we grow in that, we'll discover that reason starts to guide our emotions. So instead of just immediately emotionally reacting to what it is that we face or emotionally reacting to things that we had see, we, again, you've heard me say this before, we take that half a step back and let wisdom and reason then guide and shape our emotions. And we can develop intelligent love that is based on an enlarged view of divine things. Intelligent love based on an enlarged view of divine things. It's just like in a marriage. You know, people talk about the, I, I love her just the same as when we first got married. Well, no, I, I still love my wife as I did when we first got married, but that love has grown over the years. It has deepened as we've gone through life experiences together, as we've learned more about each other and continuing to learn about each other as our lives change, as our, as our seasons evolve and grow. That No, that, that marital relationship started with kind of freshness and newness, but now leads to deeper things, deeper emotions. And, and if we are committing to this pathway that God has placed us on, then we're going to discover that, that our love results in greater knowledge of Christ, yes, but in deeper understanding of who he is and how he is interacting with and shaping the lives of others around us. So I ask you the question that Paul wishes for us. Are your love and insight growing? And how do you know? How do you know that your love and insight 
are growing. Well, the proof's in the pudding, right? We, we talk constantly about the need to, to take some measurement, some assessment of who you are, some self-evaluation as you walk along that pathway. And, and I think about, all right, if my love is growing, if my wisdom is growing, then I will think differently, I will speak differently, I will act differently. But and as you've often heard me say, so often I think we experience growth, we show our growth by how we interact with and treat other people. You know, the Rotary Club, and some of you may be Rotarians, Rotary Club has four questions that they often ask, and I think there's a wonderful spiritual principle contained within each of these. The Rotary Club says, of the things we think, say, or do, they ask these four questions. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned. All right, the Rotary Club may use those as their four questions. I think we could probably make a pretty strong argument that those come straight out of Scripture. Those come straight out of, of holy teachings that talk about the value of watching what it is we think about, what it is that we say, and how we choose to treat other people and benefit others around us. And I think if we want to live that, that useful, holy life, then we are learning to both think and feel what is right. And that creates alignment. So let love change the way we think. And as that happens, our love will grow so that we can now move to doing what is right. Because yes, we've got to believe God has a plan for us if we want to experience that grace, right? If we want to see our thinking expanded, but it also guides our actions, and compassionate actions flow from a transformed mind. Compassionate actions flow from a transformed mind. Go back to this text, verses 10 and 11. Paul says that we want this to happen, right? Our love may abound more and more. Verse 10, so that, right? I talked about the value of those two words. So that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. In, in these last two verses, Paul is saying, here's the result of your growth. You're able to determine what is best and then choose to do it, to align yourself with God and then let your growth reflect your passion, that you are filled with the fruits of righteousness. There is evidence of the change that has taken place place. And we'll find that those duties of holiness that we talk about spring from a renewed heart. That as our heart is changed, as we, as we think about things and feel about things differently, as God influences us to see that love grow, that now we respond differently. And Paul is commending the church. He's talking to them saying, listen, I see your generosity. I see your compassionate actions. And I know where that comes from. And I'm encouraging you to keep it going. That as, as a community, as a faith community, the church here, that we are called to be inoffensive to others, not injuring them in property or feelings or reputation. Because see, sometimes we talk about love, but love is not wild and ignorant and enthusiasm. It's very warm affection for people with very clear perception about where people are spiritually and what their needs are, and then sincere actions that flow out of that to believe the best in others, to believe the best. And, and instead of con condemnation flowing out of our mouth as we look at what people choose to do, to think about understanding. How often have we talked about seek first to understand, seek first to love, seek first to console, that we are the ones that step into that gap. So what are you doing that reveals your compassionate nature that comes as a result of God's work in your life? Where are we expending our energies? Are we using those energies wisely? Are, are we pursuing genuine change, doing things that are going to help people see grace and peace and goodness like God has called us to do? Because we've got to be real about it. We've got to be fully invested in it because there's a key word and it's the word sincerity. 
to be sincere. And sincerity is our gospel perfection. Sincerity implies in us that there's been genuine life change, that there's been a conversion, a transformation that has taken place in us. Sincerity implies pure motives, that we're not doing this so that we look good. We're not doing this to inflate ourselves. We're simply doing this because it's best for other people and it's part of God's plan for their growth. And sincerity also implies honesty, that we're just genuine about this. And we're genuine about our struggles on this journey of change and transformation. That we talk about how there are plateaus. We talk about how there are days when we feel incomplete. We talk about that there are days that we struggle. And we can do all of this through what we share. Verse 7, from the message, Paul says, All along you have experienced with me the most generous help from God. All along, you have experienced with me the most generous help from God. That's that's a beautiful phrase that I can sum up in one word. Grace. We've all experienced that grace. And when we have, God transforms us in thought. He transforms us in judgment. And he transforms us in action. So do we believe that we can become more than we currently are? Because God has begun the work of grace in our soul. And what God builds will last. It will endure. And while we might be frustrated, while we might be struggling, maybe we're not. And we are cruising along in growth. It all speaks to the grace that we share. And we can measure our growth and what we care for, what we think about, and what we do. Experiencing grace expands our thinking and guides our actions. And that, my friends, is how we become more. Peace and grace to you, the grace that we share. Um, I care for you deeply. I do hope that you are continuing to grow, to ask God to to look inside of you and take you where he will. Uh, Let me pray for us as we close. Father, we thank you uh, for your consistency in our lives and that even though we might struggle and uh, have some difficulties, you are continuing to work for our good. Thank you for your confidence in us. Thank you for your strength and your spirit within us. May we be humble enough to listen to you, to hear your divine voice as you shape us, as you guide us. And may our love abound more and more. And we pray this in all the holy names of God. Amen. Take care, my friends. Think this week about becoming more.